Welcome to a new episode of Technoculture. I'm your host, Federica Bressan, and today my guest is Ray Edmondson, a consultant in audiovisual archiving that has dedicated his life to audiovisual work, to the archiving and preservation of audiovisual heritage. Welcome, Ray. Thank you, Federica. Thank you for being on Technoculture. It's a great honor to have you as a guest. We are recording this as the World Day of Audiovisual Heritage approaches. That's the 27th of October. And on top of that, 2018 is the European Year of Cultural Heritage. So a great time to talk about audiovisual heritage. I learned about you about a decade ago through your milestone publication on audiovisual archiving, Philosophy and Principles, published by UNESCO, uh, which reached the third edition in 2016, a true reference in the literature in this field, as it's kind of a unique publication and very important for the intellectual debate around audiovisual archiving. You started out in this field in the late 60s. You are a recognized pioneer in this field. But I would like to ask you to outline for us a little bit your career path, because along the years, of course, you've been involved in this field in different roles. You have served in various capacities in UNESCO and other cultural and memory institutions. Right. Look, my career path is having studied arts at university, um, I decided to join the National Library of Australia. Uh, this is back in 1968 uh, because the National Library housed what was then our National Film Archive um, and uh, was not a very high-profile high activity but was one that I wanted to um, get involved in because I'd, I'd had a, um, a long interest in Australian film and... Um, it's, uh, it's uh, as I discovered as I went on, it's preservation and it's non-visibility in a country that uh, is, uh, speaks English, so therefore finds it hard to have its own uh, film industry. I um, was at the National Library for 15 years in its film section, um, beginning as a um, junior librarian and finally ending up as head of the section. In 1984, um, the uh, what had become the... National Film Archive, part of, the, of that section, and separately elsewhere in the library, a National Sound Recording Collection, the government decided to split those off and turn them into a new institution, the National Film and Sound Archive. And so um, I became deputy director of that institution, uh, where I stayed until my retirement in 2001. So that's my um, formal bureaucratic career. Now, in the course of that, um, other things developed, such as the philosophy, which we'll talk about later. Um, the beginning of education um, uh, at the University of New South Wales, uh, the, the School of Librarianship uh, worked with us to, to establish an online course, um, a course by internet in audiovisual archiving. This was a first of its kind. It's still the only course delivered by internet at this stage and still running. Uh, now, in the course of my whole career, I formed connections with the various professional associations in our field, that's um, film archiving, sound archiving, and um, held offices in, 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 in uh, various ones of them, various times. In the course of this, contributed to their publications, which means I started writing quite a lot in our field. Uh, in 2001, I retired uh, from the NFSA um, because I couldn't continue to hold down my day job, as I saw it, and uh, develop my commitments overseas, which were sort of piling up all the time. So it was a good time um, to make that break and meant I could dev devote myself to uh, teaching and writing uh, and speaking, those sorts of things. And um, that's how it's been ever since. So the scope has sort of widened and right through that, that time, beginning in, I think, 1996, um, I also became connected to the UNESCO Memory of the World program, uh, which deals with the preservation of documentary heritage and its accessibility. It's a wider scope than the audiovisual archiving. Uh, but I've been involved in it in one way or another uh, ever since. And 
it's uh, it's now quite a large undertaking um, based on voluntary committees around the world. My current involvement uh, is as the um, as a special advisor to MOCAP, which is the member of the World Committee for Asia Pacific, that's the acronym. Um, in the course of that involvement, I have written a lot of material about memory of the world. I've um, supervised the the revision and recently re-revision of its general guidelines. Uh, this is the rule book of the program, and that's been another another writing stream for me. Uh, so that runs in parallel to my audiovisual archiving involvement, but of course. The two do intersect because UNESCO has interest in um, audiovisual archiving and in ar- archiving generally and librarianship. So speaking of UNESCO, like I said, I got to know you through this milestone publication, Audiovisual Archiving, Philosophy and Principles. Even today, I still find that it's a unique type of publication because most literature in this field deals and is concerned with the technical aspects of digitization, content transfer, then digital preservation. And what I appreciate and I find very useful uh, in this text is that you start from the beginning and clarify the terminology and address certain fundamental issues. Uh, For example, uh, in the very opening, you have a section called Why do we do the things we do? And why do we do things the way we do them? These are important questions. So I would like to ask you, what was the landscape, the conditions in uh, the 90s that made not just possible that this publication would uh, see the light, but actually uh, who suggested that there was a need for such publication? Who involved you, suggested that you be involved in this? And did you have to sit down and like think hard what should be the main guidelines in our approach and in the precisely the philosophy of what we do, or basically it was all there already embodied in the practices. These issues were clear to you and you just had to put them together in this uh, remarkable publication. So can you talk a little bit about how this work came to be in its first edition in the 90s? Well, look, uh, um, it all began actually in 1989 (laughs) um, at the FIAF Congress in Lisbon and a conversation with Wolfgang Klauer, who was the head then of the East German um, Staatliches Filmarchiv, um, himself a pioneer educator in in this field, um, uh, who I'd first met in 1973 when I was a student at the first FIAF summer school, which was held in, um, in East Berlin. And we just got talking, and he said, um, look, there's no, there is no philosophy of film archiving. And we talked about this and said, well, no, there isn't. And after that conversation, I sort of thought, well, what can we do about it? Um, And so over over time, uh, we're talking about a number of years, uh, I spoke to other people in the field, in both FIAF and IASA, um, the heads of different archives and so on, that I knew. And we started corresponding, um, not by by email, which wasn't available at the time, but by fax or by ordinary letters, and um, tossed around these ideas, you know, what, what, how do we get down to the basics of what we're doing and the basic concepts and so on. And so we formed um, a group that whose initials were AVAPIN, A-V-A-P-I-N, the Audiovisual Archiving Philosophy Interest Network, um, <clears throat> and exchanged letters. Um, this led to me writing some articles that were published in um, FIAF Journal and the YASA Journal, uh, and uh, it, it, it kind of grew so that uh, it reached a point where um, when I travelled overseas on, a, on what was a, a, an Australian government scholarship, um, a management scholarship, uh, to also spend some time um, meeting uh, people in Europe and uh, working on a, on a text. And we tried out this text at um, uh, some conferences of uh, FIAF, uh, IASA, FIAT and AMIA, you know, four of our, our associations at different different dates, um, tied out some draft text for reaction and for discussion. And the feedback was important. 
Now, not everybody was in favour of this. Some people thought it was um, a waste of time. Uh, we we all run we're running archives that are underfunded, um, working under pressure. Don't we have enough time or money to do the work we need to do? Why do we want to sit around gazing at our navels and um, pondering philosophically about the work we do? But other people thought there was a need, and so the the group reached about. 20 or more people in the end um, who were corresponding and exchanging ideas. So while in Europe, I called on Joyce Springer at UNESCO and uh, showed her the draft and said, look, you know, we think there's a need for something like this. She agreed. And so I was contracted um, by UNESCO to uh, produce a text, a final text, uh, which I did. And so it was published in 1998 um, as under the title of a philosophy of what image archiving. Uh, it was revised in 2004 with a change of title, and most recently in 2016, uh, there's a third edition. Uh, now, the um, three editions obviously bear some similarities to each other, but they're all also different. And uh, in the latest edition, of course, we have to deal with issues, the issues of digitization, which did not loom as large before, but, but certainly did loom large by 2016. Now, in each case, um, it hasn't been me alone. There have been a group of people involved in um, looking at draft text and commenting back and discussing it. And <clears throat> in this latest iteration, there was an editorial group of eight people um, put together according to UNESCO's rules. They have rules about these things. Um, so it was gender balanced and geographically balanced and balanced according to the connections that each, per each person had within the profession, now, which... Um, uh, which of the professional associations they were related to and so on. Uh, so that's that's the story. Um, now, it, it is still the case, I think, that um, uh, not everyone is on the same wavelength about this. The earliest iteration, um, when I was preparing it, um, I remember some correspondence with the uh, Secretary General of FIAF who pointed out to me that, um, well, you know, some people didn't think it was a good idea and some people found me a bit suspect because... I was um, talking to film archivists and sound archivists at the time, and while it's now hard to realise this was the case, these were like two armed camps that kind of hated each other. Uh, and the fact that I was dealing with both may be a bit of a traitor to each. But there was a need to bridge that gap in the first place because uh, these two fields had grown up more or less independent of each other and didn't talk much to each other. And there was a need to, to bridge them and see, well, we're talking about a, a profession that covers both um, film and sound. Uh, and then even as late as, as 2016, when the latest edition was published and was considered um, two days after its publication by a meeting of the CCAAA, which is the Coordinating Council of Audiovisual Archive Associations, it was clear that many people in the meeting although they hadn't read the text, uh, were expecting something quite different. They wanted a, a technical manual, and that's not what this was. So uh, they not, 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 not terribly, many people not terribly happy about it, to the extent that um, they asked UNESCO to suspend publication so that the text could be um, checked out by the technical committees of various associations, which was entirely missing the point. UNESCO, of course, refused, and uh, it was the publication simply went ahead and... and since then, the translation has gone ahead. So uh, the idea of a philosophy does not appeal uh, in the same way to everybody. The idea that we that the profession is about uh, how-to manuals and technical standards and so on, and that's all it is, still hovers there. And uh, particularly, I think, with, with, with people of longer standing in the field. Um, and uh, the idea of looking at it in a from a philosophical point of view is, is not what attracts them. But... For all that, uh, for younger people, I think it's rather different. The The book is um, standard reading in the various courses. And uh, um, I noted in a, a recent survey done by EMEA <clears throat> that um, uh, in the reading list of 14 different courses across the across North America, and I hear I'm talking about a course in um, archival science, not not just um, audiovisual archiving, um, in the their electives on... Uh, uh, audiovisual media, uh, it was second highest in the list of required reading. The highest document was a publication of the uh, National Preservation Board of the Library of Congress, which, of course, would be required reading for everybody in um, North America. But this worst one came immediately after. So 
it's seen as important in the courses, uh, and this is what young people are absorbing as they enter the field now. In the publication, there are several concepts that I have made my own since about a decade ago. And uh, they are fundamental concepts that then also have consequences in the practice. One, for example, is the need to define audiovisual materials not by negation, not by what they're not, like the expression non-book material. So a rethinking of what these objects truly mean to us and to find a way to describe them that is appropriate that's very important. Or another concept is, for example, the fact that preservation is not a discrete process. Nothing has ever been preserved. It is only being preserved. So despite the uh, specificity of audiovisual materials, and so all we know to be important, I want to ask kind of the complementary question, and that is... At the same time, audiovisual material is part of our cultural heritage. It's archival material for the most part. So there must be also an overlap with the approach to book preservation, the traditional approach. What is that overlap? What could we learn from that? What is the continuation of that tradition that we could export, so to speak, and adapt to audiovisual materials? Well, look, I think all of the, what I call the memory professions, and here we're talking about uh, librarianship, uh, archival science, um, conservation, museology, um, gallery curatorship, these are all um, professions that uh, deal with the preservation and accessibility of memory, um, if we can use that kind of broader concept, which is the way UNESCO looks at it. Now, memory takes many forms. Uh, it it's, it's, um, can be orally transmitted. Um, uh, and many cultures are oral cultures. Um, it can be recorded in various ways, in writing, um, in speech, in vision, uh, or in the creation of objects. All of these things encapsulate memory. And so when you talk about preservation, the concept of preservation is basic. It means, um, firstly, uh, keeping whatever the object is, if it's, if it's a physical object, keeping the object safe so it can continue its life. If it's oral, it means uh, keeping the tradition alive uh, from one generation to the next. And um, it's it's the continuation of memory, something that's actually unique to the human species. Um, we can record memories in various ways and we can transmit them to the next generation. Um, this is something that other species just can't do. So um, the notion of preservation is fundamental to that, the continuation of the existence of a document or of information or of an idea. And then the point of preservation, by definition, has to be accessibility. Otherwise, why do you bother keeping it? Um, so you preserve for the purpose of making something accessible. And uh, for it to be accessible, people have to know that it's there and where to go looking for it. So it's kind of it's awareness raising. You know, where where do I go to find information to find memory? Now, out of that general idea. Um, different professions have evolved because they deal with different kinds of documents differently. So libraries have evolved because they deal with discrete works. A book is a discrete work. A journal um, edition is a discrete work. It's a discrete object, a discrete thing. And they organise the collections along the lines of these, these discrete things. So cataloguing in, in a library sense is about, you know, the book has, has this author, it's about this subject, these are its contents. And you have a catalog entry. Um, a, a journal, an issue of a journal, is treated in much the same way. Uh, archives, as we now understand them, keep records. Um, and unlike books in libraries, which are published, archival records are often not published. They're not disseminated to the general public. They exist as a record of a transaction, of an action, uh, an exchange of information. And the way that archives organise their collections, unlike libraries, which um, organise discrete works, archives organise their collections uh, in a continuum so that uh, one record relates to the next record. So if you have a file of correspondence, uh, this letter relates to the one before it and the one before that and so on. The, the, the meaning, meaning in, the, uh, in the records is comes out through the relationship of one record to another. That means collections are organised conceptually in quite a different way. When we talk about museums, um, 
and uh, art galleries. They're, to a large extent, dealing with physical objects and um, conservation, the keeping of an object in a form that um, continues its life without degradation is fundamental. So if you're going to preserve a painting, um, then how you physically handle it, store it, display it, look after it, the conditions in which it's displayed um, relate to its physical uh, survival and its accessibility. And conservation, uh, the profession of conservation is about stabilising objects um, and removing the accretions of age or damage, if you can, to restore it to its original condition. And uh, so that this is a concept that's related to objects. Now, when you put those together, um, audiovisual archiving has aspects of all, all three things. Um, for the most part, uh, we perceive uh, films, television programs, um, other audiovisual documents as, as discrete entities. They, have, um, they can be described by a title or a series. Uh, they're published uh, in most cases. And, um, and so you, you catalogue them in a, in a way that's rather similar to the way libraries catalogue their material. But it's also archival in the sense that, it's, um, that one um, work can relate to another. And the notion of preservation before you give access is quite fundamental, um, more so in archives than perhaps libraries. When a library acquires a book, it just puts it on a shelf um, and it's accessible. When archives acquire archives, the notion of preservation starts to loom large at the beginning because the condition in which the records are received may not be particularly good. And then the notion of uh, museum notion of dealing with an object, um, uh, well, relates to all physical media uh, and also now to, to digi the concept of, of digital objects. Uh, but the notion of conservation, uh, of uh, restoring an object to its um, original condition as far as possible, uh, is, um, is very particular to, uh, to physical objects. Now, we see these things relating to um, audiovisual media. A film is an object and it often needs restoration, uh, careful storage and skilled handling. Um, to get access to it, it needs the, the interpolation of a, of, a, um, of a medium, of a, of a mechanism, physical or digital. So when you, you, kind of, you kind of look at the aspects of these professions, which have all evolved to keep different kinds of records and to or objects and to provide access to them, when you're dealing with audiovisual media, you're kind of taking aspects of all three because that's the nature of the media we're dealing with. Um, it has a physical... Uh, being in many cases. Uh, if not, it has a, has a digital um, reality. It has to be perceived through a um, technological mechanism, uh, whatever that mechanism is. And um, uh, so, it's, so accessibility depends on utilising that mechanism. And uh, it can take a great many forms. You can see a film in a movie theatre, you can listen to um, sound recordings on radio or a, a, um, a gramophone uh, or now on the internet uh, through, through various digital applications. Uh, so it, it's, um, if you're talking about an audiovisual document, which is the term I use, you perceive all of its different characteristics. Uh, I used um, an analogy um, um, in my teaching that tries to explain this. Uh, if you imagine... Um, a mythical country, I called it Batonia, uh, and the um, someone in a, in a government a ministry moves a filing cabinet and finds behind it some cans of film, and they don't know what to do with this, so the minister calls a meeting, um, and he puts the cans of film on the table, and he's he has uh, the heads of the National Library of Batonia, the National Archives, uh, the National Art Gallery the National Museum and the National Audiovisual Archive. And he says, well, we found this film. Um, <clears throat> it's tr actually a travelogue of Batonia um, of about 50 years ago uh, when the country looked very differently, very different to the way it is now. Uh, it was made by the national artist because the national artist is a revered position in Batonia. And it was narrated by the president of that day uh, so it was a very prestigious film and it was narrated by the president. So it was shown widely, I guess, and we didn't get into those details, but there it is. It's a record of the country. 
Um, it's also an artistic creation of the national artist. It carries the imprimatur of um, the president. And the um, question is, where does this film go to? So the National Library start, spoke first and said, well, it should come to the National Library because it's the history of Batonia. This is how the country looked 50 years ago. And we want to add it to our collection of Batoniania, of the history of our country. So it should be part of the National Library. The National Archives said, no, it should come to the National Archives because uh, it's narrated by the president. And it's, uh, it makes it a government record. Uh, so it's it's uh, um, evidence of a transaction. Uh, the president made this record and we need to preserve it as a government record. The National Museum said, well, no, it really should come to us because uh, it's shot in Dufay colour, which is a, now an obsolete colour process. And the National Museum makes a specialty of collecting photographic equipment and, and um, examples of film processes and putting them on show. Uh, National Art Gallery said, well, really, it was made by the National Artists. It's a work of art. So it needs to come to the National Art Gallery. And so the minister turned around to the head of the National Audiovisual Archive and said, well, what have you got to say? And the head of the National Audiovisual Archive said, well, it needs to come to us because it's a film. And the way we deal with film, uh, we can represent all of those aspects of its character. It is a finished work. It is a, is a published document, um, just like a book or a journal. Uh, it is a government record. Uh, we can rep we can recognise that fact in the way we catalogue it. Uh, yes, it's um, a representative of a, of a obsolete colour process. We deal with those all the time, and we have the equipment and the knowledge um, to preserve such things in their proper way. And yes, um, many films are works of art, and so we recognise the concept of work of art in the way we catalogue, display, and provide access to our material. And so the film went to the National Audiovisual Archive. So I guess I'm really saying that it's a way of illustrating how an audiovisual archive is an amalgam of these um, these traditions um, and, of course, adds on top of it the the character of what it's dealing with. Uh, an audiovisual document, whether it's a film, a television program, a digital file, um, a physical gramophone recording or whatever, um, all exist in, in, in our heads. They don't have any objective existence. Uh, we perceive moving images because we see them through a, uh, a projector or um, an electronic um, means. Uh, it's a number of images per second that run together in our heads, so we perceive them as movement. They're really real images. The moving image does, ha does not have any objective existence. Now, when we listen to sound, um, it's really disturbances in the atmosphere impinging on our ears, which we interpret as meaningful sounds, but they have no objective existence. So this is their nature, and um, fundamentally we need to recognise that's their nature, and so the way we preserve them and deal with them um, starts off at, at that point. And having cleared what is unique about audiovisual materials and why they differ from other types of archival materials, I'd still like to ask why it was obvious or why was it then decided to group audio and video together? Why couldn't these two things be different enough to require separate publications, separate methodologies, separate philosophies maybe? Well, at, in the beginning, of course, it did require a different approach. And the first, um, the profession grew out of very, very gradually from the existing institutions. Um, so places like the British Museum and um, uh, the Library of Congress, um, which had very different jobs and very different approaches. Um, and they, they, to the extent that they embraced these things themselves, they saw them as an extension of existing um, existing tasks. So the British Museum uh, began collecting films around 1900 and, uh, but didn't quite know what to do with them because they didn't fit into an existing concept that they were handling. Yes, they were obsolete physical objects and the British Museum also at that time had the nation's largest book collection. Um, the collection has now become in later years the British Library. But it didn't really know how to... Um, how to characterise them. The Library of Congress um, saw um, 
films as an extension of still photography. And so they developed this, what is now a really odd approach uh, of saying, um, if you want to register your copyright, which in the US you must do, if you want to register copyright, you must deposit your work with the Library of Congress. Um, they had no way of dealing with, with movies. So that some came up with the idea that um, movies are a succession of still photographs. So if instead of printing the film on celluloid, if you make a print of the film on paper and lodge out with the Library of Congress, we will record that as a group of still photographs. And they, this went on for about, uh, I think, until 1912. So uh, it, it, this, the field emerged in this really strange way. But sound recordings um, were ways of um, initially um, recording uh, ethnographic realities. Um, uh, ethnographers who would visit um, different tribes and communities and record their songs and, um, and speech on Edison cylinders. Um, they saw those obviously as, as ethnographic records. And so the oldest film archive in the world today is the, um, the uh, Austrian uh, phonogram archive in Vienna, which began for that, for, that, for that purpose and still exists for that purpose of um, ethnographic recordings. Now, as, as uh, work went on, um, the idea of having um, specific institutions to look after films developed in one arena where film is an industry, an entertainment industry, as well as um, producing documentary records, and people in various countries saw the need to, to keep such collections um, in a non-commercial environment. And similarly, um, the idea of recording so of sound archives in different institutional contexts emerged separately. Um, the film archives re came together and realised their character in 1938 by establishing FIAF, International Federation of Film Archives, which had initially four members. And YASA grew out of, um, that's the International Association of Sound Archives, as it then was, grew out of the International Association of Music Libraries. Um, so um, recording was seen as a medium for recording music, not so much speech. And so it, it came into its own sometime in the 60s. Um, these, these fields just grew um, in their own particular historical way without really intersecting. And, and, and uh, as I mentioned, you know, sometimes being jealous of each other. Where do they intersect? The first time I, on record that I think it happened was in Russia um, in about in the early 30s, where there was an archive that collected sound recordings and films and photographs, and which I think then disappeared soon after. Strange and uh, oddly speaking, the next time that happened was here in Australia in 1935, um, where for reasons that we can't entirely be sure of now, um, the federal government decided to establish something called, and I, this is a mouthful of a title, the National Historical Film and Speaking Record Library. Um, and they <clears throat> placed this under the control, the joint control, of the Government Film Production Unit. The, the Film Production Unit of the government made um, advertising documentaries to promote Australia. And the Commonwealth National Library, which was the then an institution that actually included the National Archives and various other entities that later split off. So this was it. This, this, this little entity was created under the aegis of these two bodies. Um, clearly because someone in the, in the mix saw the point of recording, um, of drawing together historical records in, in sound form and film form. And we're talking here about documentary material, not entertainment. Um, it was seen very much as a historical record uh, in these two forms. But this is where it happened in Australia. Now, that really wasn't followed up for a long time we do, until we get to the, um, the, I guess, the 70s or 80s. Um, we, we, we still see these two camps, film and sound, um, operating separately. But there was a gradual coming together as... Um, uh, film archives had to expand into video and sound archives also found themselves expanding into video because that's the way industry and entertainment were going. So in Australia, when the National Film and Sound Archive was, was set up, um, there was a, uh, and I'm not sure if there were any comparable predecessors, but it was certainly made sense in this country <clears throat> to bring the two together 
because they'd been they'd been conceived by back in the 30s, not necessarily followed through very well, but the concept was there. And so the NFSA was set up quite deliberately to cover the spectrum of film, television, radio and recorded sound um, and was seen as an entity. Uh, while this, I guess that's 1984, we go back a little bit to UNESCO again, where the notion of bringing these separate entities together, the film archives and the sound archives, and by then the television archives, also a separate stream, to talk to each other, uh, was initiated by UNESCO into what was called the round table of audiovisual archives. And here we get the term being applied to the, um, the field as a whole. So these were movements that um, were sort of gradually coming together. The NFSA was a, and it was a visible manifestation of that idea. Um, but the idea was already active in UNESCO. And um, over time, and t with the assistance of technological change, it's, it's become much more mainstream. So, uh, and when you think about it, um, well, there are obvious linkages. And um, I can recall vividly within the NFSA when it was first created, it brought together the sound people and the film people from the National Library who lived in two different worlds. And um, did not immediately see themselves as corresponding to each other, and most definitely do not see themselves as operating um, on the same um, database. You couldn't have a film database and a sound database as, as one one complete um, creation. Now we had to demonstrate that, that was possible that a single database could encompass sound recordings, film, television, radio, uh, and other and um, uh, and related things, as well as physical documentation such as posters books, scripts, and things of that kind. And uh, we established uh, such a database that showed it could be done. Um, that was a crucial step in the development of the, of the institution. Um, and of course, it was, um, it was followed, uh, followed by others. And uh, the software that was developed in the NFSA was later bought by others, including the Library of Congress. In your publication, you also stress the importance of training professional figures. And it's more than just giving the right skills to the professionals involved in this field, but it's about recognizing this professional figure as something specific. And I think by reflection, to give importance to the heritage that is being taken care of. Can you talk a little bit about how training programs have emerged or have evolved since you started advocating for this? Uh, well, uh, the, um, the idea of a profession, uh, of a separate profession, I guess, would go back, I'm not sure when that would go back to, but uh, if we think of people in um, various film, sound, television archives, uh, and how they perceived themselves. It was evident um, when we were, well, in those days when we were discussing development of the, of the philosophy, that, that people often conceived themselves as a creature of the institution they came from. So people who um, might be working with, with film but were part of a, a library conceived themselves as librarians um, uh, and archivists and, and museologists ditto. So to develop the idea, the notion of a, an individual profession was very gradual. I think the, um, the creation of summer schools, um, so I mentioned the 1973 summer school in um, East Germany, which I attended, which was the very first uh, training exercise run by FIA. Um, but, and that idea was continued and instead still continues today. Um, and it was followed up by IASA in later years. So these were the initial courses that focused on um, an aspect of audiovisual archiving and nothing else and gave people a sense of identity. I've been to a training school, here's my certificate and so on. Um, the first, this developed gradually, the first university course uh, was at the University of East Anglia in Britain, uh, which would have started, um, let's see, in the, in the early 90s, I think. And... Uh, that grew out of a, um, a film archive connection. Um, there was a film archive that re was related to the university and um, it, the course grew naturally out of that. And it was a one year uh, elective course that related to the <coughs> film studies course uh, in the university. So it was an elective of that. Uh, the next one I think was um, George Eastman House in Rochester, 
USA. Um, George Eastman House is one of the um, oldest uh, film archives in the US. And the, um, the idea of a course that uh, could be related to that film archive um, followed soon on. And I think it was established where in uh, about 20, about 1997, 96 thereabouts. The um, initial student intake was six people. And the course was related uh, in a practical sense, like the one at East Anglia, to working with an archive. So the students would do a, a, a year-long course and they would do intern work in an archive. It was very very hands-on course. Um, so once these were operating and you had formal qualifications that had university acceptance coming out of it, along with the course that we developed in Australia by, that was offered by internet, uh, which would have um, begun, I guess, not long after that. Uh, it, was, it meant that university recognised this was an emerging profession and were willing to offer a, um, a qualification of some kind in relation to it. So it, it, it simply grew over time as other universities took, took on this idea. Um, so we now have the Netherlands, um, University of Amsterdam, uh, UCLA in, in uh in the United States, um, New York University, uh, some universities in, in Latin America um, that offer courses in whatever, in one aspect or another of audiovisual archiving. Now, along with that has gone the development of um, modules in um, archival science courses or librarianship courses in uh, various universities around the world. And these uh, will be electives in an overall librarianship or archival science or related course. Uh, it leads to some, I guess, peculiar arrangements um, where uh, in UCLA, uh, for example, in, um, in California, uh, the, the master's course there is a, if I remember correctly, now under the School of Librarianship at university. Um, it's, it's, it's wandered around with, with other attachments. Um, in uh, George Eastman House, uh, now called George Eastman Museum, the course there has become connected to the University of Rochester. So to get your master's, you do a one-year course at Eastman House. It's called the Selznick School. And you do another year um, at University of Rochester on a project-related um, course, and you get your MA. So these have all developed um, independently, but with some con with some connection with each other. And of course, as the various um, international federations have grown, the courses are advertised through those federations and promoted. And uh, so the students often come from, from those connections. And through those, profession, through those, those uh, professional associations, may find their way back into the, into the field and gain, and gain employment. So that's how it now works. And uh, so if you look at what I feel are the characteristics of a, of a profession, it's, it has grown up. Uh, it now, I think, meets those characteristics of having a language, a terminology and concept of its own. It has a literature um, and it has people who, who identify with that profession first and foremost, rather than primarily identifying as a librarian or an archivist. It's been a gradual thing. And um, I think um, uh, recently um, uh, I was asked to write an article as a follow-up to an article I wrote in 20 years earlier called is film archiving, archiving a profession? Would I reflect on what's happened in 20 years? Has it grown up? Uh, my answer was yes, it has, and it is now um, it is now a fully fledged profession, with some work still to do, still a work in progress, um, but I think sufficiently mature now that it can be seen that way. Since the 90s, the internet has exploded, and there is no shortage of user-generated content, mostly uploaded on free platforms, and it's a lot of audio and video. Do you think that the archival community should be concerned with this type of, well, non-curated material and also so much of it? Is this a challenge for audiovisual archiving today? Uh, they should definitely be concerned about it, um, and, it's, and it's being faced in various degrees. I think, um, uh, because, again, because all archives are limited in their finance and uh, have to make choices about what they preserve, we see a spectrum. We see some archives um, who are 
they're determined to remain analogue archives and they're going to look after film or sound recording in the analogue sense and that's their that's their field. Um, we find, um, I think, m most archives, however, embracing digital media in some way. Clearly, um, film production, for example, is now, la is now very largely digital. Um, audio production is very largely digital. And um, material is now often received and and kept in a digital form. And so all the issues about digital preservation come to the fore. And um, uh, you go back to the, the fundamental issue about you know, how do you, how do you um, achieve long-term preservation. But we have the exploding um, internet and YouTube and the enormous number of ways in which um, moving images and sound recordings are created. And yes, um, archives have to be aware of them. I think um, capturing things from YouTube, for example, um, often things that might be that are important that may disappear very quickly is crucial. And so the um, the medium has to be monitored in some way uh, to, to capture that, to capture what should be kept. I don't say that's easy. And I think we're in the beginning stages of working out how to do that. Done manually uh, by someone sitting down at a computer and sort of tracking through um, YouTube every day is very labor intensive and um, will achieve any limited results. I think we're going to be looking at um, developments of artificial intelligence and so on to find an easier way of, of, uh, of tracking, uh, working out what to keep. And uh, the same is true of the broadcast media where things go out on air and um, unless they're captured immediately, they're lost. Um, uh, radio, um, chat shows, news, um, public affairs, these things often just go into the ether and are not kept. And so capturing these things, again, in an organised basis as far as possible, um, is really is really crucial. Uh, for example, um, the NFSA in Australia has... Um, has a practice of capturing uh, a newscast every day from a different television station, so that we are capturing the news of the day, um, but from different different points of view, because news is reported very differently uh, on different types of television stations. Um, on the the government networks, uh, it's it's um, it's one way, and on the commercial networks, it'll be a very different style. And so, this is the the audiovisual media surrounding us, and the challenge is how we select uh, what to keep. And it's getting harder and harder all the time. So much of this material is being produced that it's pretty fair to say that, of course, we cannot preserve everything. So I wonder if the problem of selecting what to preserve may become the core issue and then how to preserve becomes a secondary question as opposed to saying, this is how we should keep these materials and now let's start applying it to as much of it as we can in a sort of attempt to preserve everything. And since we cannot preserve it all, we will die trying. Well, if you look around you, it is clearly impossible to preserve everything now. We've all got um, cell phones. We all produce moving images all the time. What happens to those images? You know, they, they replace the old family photographs. Most of them will disappear over time and very little will be kept. So that um, uh, home movies, which used to be on film and which sometimes find their way into archives, are now replaced by digital movies, which for the most part will never find their way into archives because they'll be lost. Um, we just won't keep them ourselves. Uh, fundamental to what any archive does, I think, is a selection policy. You must have a conscious um, notion of what you want to keep and why. And uh, it can't be just you know, what appeals to you. It has to be logical. It has to answer to the people who fund you uh, and what they expect and to the public that expects certain things from you. So uh, there needs to be a conscious selection policy developed and it needs to be um, checked regularly with the, an archives constituency, with its public, with its users uh, and its stakeholders. So it's kept up to date. Uh, and staff have to not only follow it, but they also have to have a degree of discretion because no selection policy will tell you everything you can do. You've got to make judgments all the time. So selection is inevitable. How we do it um, requires, to the extent that we can do it, a logical ordered approach and then judgment and then relying on the best tools available. Um, can you give everything? Uh, the answer, I think, is no. I know that... Um, a couple of years ago when I checked with um, 
the tele the archive and branch that keeps um, television and radio they download the whole output of a range of stations every day that means everything and try to keep it i don't think that can continue forever i think there'll have to be selection um because the sheer magnitude of what has to be kept will be overwhelming so but also having a selection policy um provides a sense of purpose to an archive you're there for what reason um to preserve the national memory to preserve a segment of it um to capture a range of um, things happening in the media around you. What, what's your purpose? And what do people expect of you? And what does the taxpayer expect of you? Uh, that comes down to an archive's accessibility because unless you're accessible, people won't know you're there and they won't see any value for money, taxpayers' money that's spent on you. So a justification of your existence is accessibility. So it was never easy uh, and it's getting harder all the time. I would like to insist on this point for a moment, if you bear with me. It seems to me like a very crucial question. That of preserving everything or selecting the material very well. We just said that we cannot preserve everything. So it seems a reasonable consequence of that to say, oh, then we should select very carefully. But my impression, uh, in my experience, you know, it's just that we would rather die trying to preserve everything than select. And we will leave behind a partial set of documents uh, that express our culture, but also the impression that we were virtuous because we tried so hard. So we died trying at least. Now, one argument to want to preserve everything is that if we select what to preserve of our own culture, we might be biased and we might choose the materials that will make us look good in the future. As opposed to preserving everything, then people in the future will be able to look back and make their own reflections. But preserving everything is not possible and in a way then not selecting consciously is also an, an implicit decision and what will be left will also be anyway the result of what we cared for the most in a weird way, in a, in a way that happened in the past, I think, for what concerned the history of kings and popes, you know. So large archives today, those who have access to infrastructure and financial support are more likely to put in place effective preservation strategies that will also survive a long time as opposed to the small archives or maybe archives with materials that are not on high demand today. So the importance of selection and not die trying in the attempt of preserving everything seems to me very important because it's a choice anyway, one way or the other, and better a deliberate choice than not because we will leave an impression of who we were anyway and me personally I'd rather have someone criticize me for a conscious choice I made than scaring away from the responsibility of a choice and let them draw the conclusions of what what our society really valued yes look um, see one of the dilemmas is Whatever choice we exert now to preserve uh, reflects the way we see the world right now. It can't reflect the way people 20 years from now will see the world. And so um, that's a limitation already. And our perspective will not necessarily be the one that people 20 years from now would like to have. So that's already a limitation. We have to try to predict what people um, uh, ahead of us will expect. When you, when you look at all the images and sounds that are now recorded, uh, all the surveillance videos around the world, um, all the um, movies and sound recordings created on our cell phones, uh, it's, it's gargantuan. And we live in a society that is, um, because of fears of security, is more and more monitored by, monitored by images and sounds that are recorded and kept by various authorities. Uh, not everybody is happy with this. Do we really want uh, to live in a, a 1984 type society as Orwell saw it, 
where everything we do is documented um, and, um, and monitored by other people. Is that the sort of society we want or don't we have any privacy at all? That's, that's, the, that's where it comes to in the end. So, and I don't see that there's um, an answer to that. Uh, yes, if we could keep everything, you'd have a real access problem. How would you find what you were looking for? And how would you trawl through this, this um, enormous mountain of data that, that kept increasing exponentially? Um, but um, how to ensure we can keep what people in future generally might want to see? And um, I'm not sure there's an easy answer to that. I mean, let me give you a very, um, very practical question, a very practical illustration. When I was um, very new in this field, uh, we're going back now to um, about 1970, it was the practice in the National Library of Australia when it was copying nitrate film to copy it onto 16 millimeter and destroy the original. Now that <laughs> that appalls people today. Um, the reduction of quality. Um, the um, the lack of technical oversight. Nobody ever checked the result. They just left it up to the lab to figure that out. Uh, and um, uh, and the loss of the original, which contains so much information that you can never transfer to a copy anyway. It was a shocking thing to do from today's perspective, and yet it was the, it was the the policy and the norm. A because it saved money. B because of a cultural attitude. Uh, and when I question this with my boss. I said, why don't we copy everything on 35 millimeter instead of 16? Um, yes, it would cost more money, but we're, you know, we're thinking about the future. He said, he said, look, Ray, you've got to be philosophical about this and he used that word. Australia made terrible films. We're keeping, we're keeping a record of them, but no one will ever want to study these. They just want to know that they existed. That was the cultural view. And that was a view not held within just in the National Library, it would have been like a widely held view in Australian culture. And now it's quite different today, but that was the view at the time. So we worked with those sorts of limitations. Yes, of course, we did move on to 35 millimeter copying, etc., etc. You know, that the, uh, it all changed, but that was that's how it was then. So we always were all blinkered by our cultural attitudes of today, <clears throat> and trying to see beyond them is really quite difficult. Uh, we have to try. So what is somebody in um, in 2040 going to want to see and listen to from our era? I don't know. Um, will it be our, our, our creative works, our feature films, our songs, our recordings? Um, will it be documentaries? Certainly it will be documentaries um, because it will record a world that will look very different by 2040 if we have global warming and the loss of species and so on. Um, but what about the personal communications, you know, the family albums, the equivalent of the family albums and so on? Well, we want to see those. What about the surveillance videos? Will they be of any use to us? And so on and so on. We can look at each type of um, recording we're now making and we can try to project that question. Um, so in, in the end, there's no real answer that I can see. It's a bit of a philosophical dilemma. Um, it's We're governed by practicalities and by, I suppose, our imagination. And uh, we do try to see ahead um, with the eyes of the future insofar as we can. And what do you think about this fact that we are the first society to actively preserve the products of our own culture and the responsibility that comes with that? Yeah, look, I think, well, let's just go back into the past. Um, there were um, <clears throat> deliberate efforts in the past Let's go back to the Library of Alexandria. It's about almost 2,000 years ago. Um, I'm sure there are other examples of this, but that was that was a, an institution that deliberately set out to collect um, the writings of the, of its day. That mean, meant writings of not only philosophers but um, of historians, of mathematicians, of scientists, and so on, as they were um, 2,000 years ago. And this was an institution. It was linked. Uh, it was a learning institution. And um, it kept writing on scrolls um, because that was the medium of the day. Uh, and it was presumably with the intent that, that the uh, material would be kept, would be permanently available. I'm not sure if you could um, find the librarian of the Library of Alexandria at the, t the time, whether he would be speaking with the same concepts that we're using now. Um, but um, 
but also archival records in various forms were made by various civilizations, ancient Egypt, Sumeria, um, and others. Again, whether they thought of how they would be kept long term and um, how it could be done, we we don't know. But there have been attempts at various times in various cultures to collect and preserve. But what has happened uh, over uh, over centuries is material has been lost or destroyed, um, sometimes deliberately, um, because incoming culture didn't like what they found. Um, <clears throat> the Library of Alexandria has was um, destroyed in several phases, but an incoming culture didn't think what was there was worth keeping and got rid of it. Um, some has been lost by neglect, some because the institutional structures disappeared, and, um, uh, and that's why things come down to us now as a matter of luck or, or coincidence. Um, where, for example, some of the writings that would have been originally been in the Library of Alexandria um, found their way into uh, the Arab cultures and um, were transcribed and then came to the what we now call the West uh, via that means. So what we're doing now is not entirely new or unique. We're just doing it on a far larger scale and with many more institutions. And... Um, uh, for, I guess, from a number of different reasons and for purpose of, of popular access rather than very limited individual access that many of these early institutions would have had. Um, we still face the same question of how stable are our institutions? Will they last? Um, where do they get their support from? And um, the larger they get and the bigger the preservation problems become, the more they'll cost. Um, will governments or philanthropists and so on continue to fund them? And what happens if they don't? So we still have issues about how stable and long-lasting our institutional structures are. And preservation um, has to include the notion of a stable and continuing institutional structure. Without that, everything's open to chance. So it is a fundamental question. Um, we're looking, let me take the, the um, example of the National Amazon Archive again. It's been through so many um, changes and threats to its survival. It's a government body uh, that you have to you know, be, be very aware of um, what threats might come in the future. It was once part of a, a, a library where it had a fairly low priority, but it became a, a separate body. Um, its uh, survival was dependent on the um, opinions of um, various ministers and, and funding um, authorities. When, when it gained a parliamentary backing, what its own legislation became more secure, uh, but its budget is at the um, uh, at the behest of um, a government um, that wants to spend less and less money on such institutions. Uh, it's more than once been threatened with dissolution um, and uh, dispersion of its collections and so on. So institutions are fragile things and we can't assume that... Um, the way they are now will be the way they are in 10 years or 20 years. All sorts of things may happen to the collections and to their institutional structures. And it's on the structures that we have to depend for um, the implementation of policies, the training of people um, in the disciplines that are required and so on. So yes, we are making um, enormous efforts now around the world to preserve in ways in, to an extent we never have before. And the preservation of audiovisual um, documents are essentially a creation of um, the 20th century. Uh, they don't, they're they're um, something new. They didn't exist before. Um, and uh, they have all sorts of technical and other challenges related, related to them. But um, we have to um, be very realistic about, you know, what might come next. Uh, we can't ever take the future for granted and the future stability of institutions for granted. They've had to be fought for in the past. They'll have to be fought for in the future. The landscape of audiovisual archives is not equal across the world. There might be countries or continents where there are larger infrastructures and other places where specific types of materials are more popular because of social, cultural trends and reasons. Can you talk a little bit about different situations that we may find across the world in the light of your extensive travels and your professional and personal networks? 
Well, the world is a very uneven place and opportunities are very uneven. So um, uh, the poorer countries have less money to spend on institutions, um, less money to spend on training and um, and, prob and possibly um, institutions are more at risk in those countries. In affluent countries like Australia, um, well, you make the institutions as permanent as you can if they're government bodies by having legislation that uh, fixes their place in the scheme of things. Um, but they remain vulnerable to varying uh, degrees of government funding. And uh, now those institutions can um, support staff members being trained. Um, they can uh, participate in, in the international associations. The associations themselves are important um, avenues for encouraging the stability of institutions and the continuity of institutions and can set standards and sometimes encourage um, things to happen or try to prevent things happening sometimes. So the, 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 those global networks are, are important stabilizers in my view, uh, provided they can set and enforce standards and, and encourage training and encourage the stability of institutions. They can never fundamentally guarantee any of those things. They can only try to increase the chances of it. I look at long-standing institutions like um, Library of Congress in the US. Um, that's probably about as stable an institution as one could expect to find. It's been there for more than 200 years. And it has a very large uh, audiovisual archiving um, aspect, uh, but it's fundamentally a library. And um, it's long been the case. I think I don't know whether it still is. I can't speak for people currently there. Um, uh, a lesser culturally a lesser priority than perhaps the printed word, which is traditionally the um, the major province of libraries. It would be hard to imagine the Library of Congress um, getting rid of that activity, but it may be affected by, by budgetary changes, um, by political changes. For example, the, um, uh, the election of Donald Trump as, as a president uh, has sent a shockwave through many of these institutions because arts funding decreases and they feel threatened. So um, political change of that kind can be, um, well, it's something you can't predict, but it can have a, a profound effect. Uh, I would hope that we're safe in Australia, but I never, never assume it. And I look at um, other institutions, that apparently long, long running ones that have been uh, threatened by change of governments. I'm thinking of the um, Moscow Film Museum uh, which um, was a long-established body, but which uh, lost out to um, uh, <clears throat> political changes under Vladimir Putin, um, lost its premises. Um, other staff were moved in to take over. The, the knowledgeable staff were, were dismissed, uh, and so on. This can happen, again, in any society. Uh, the um, uh, Cinemateca Brasileira, uh, which I visited maybe a decade ago, um, very effective archive, political change in that country that meant that many of the staff um, uh, had lost their jobs. Um, it became the subject of, uh, as I understand it, um, a political fight. Um, and uh, a consequence of that was they had a nitrate fire and lost part of their nitrate collection. The, these are unpredictables. Um, you um, can never... Uh, there's this phrase future proof which you know you're supposed to guarantee that nothing will happen in the future there's no such thing as future proofing you can't uh, guarantee what will not happen in the future so to me the only real guarantee is the vigilance of individuals who are involved in the various situations working through their um their institutions through their own government systems um through uh professional associations through bodies like unesco that encourage standards uh, try to enforce standards um, and through certainly important in Australia advocacy groups who um, who watch what is happening and when they become unhappy pressure governments and um, uh, try to change the way things are that's been crucial it is absolutely crucial in Australia uh, that um, volunteer advocacy groups that means people who as individuals um, come from the, the audiovisual archiving field or related fields and when they see something that's um, that's uh, dangerous, they create publicity, um, they draw it to government's attention, they lobby, they try to um, to make things better. 
it's only because of such grips that we have the National Film and Sound Archive as it, is, as it stands now. And in any country, um, such grips are absolutely essential, which means it kind of comes back to the individuals involved, um, our commitment and um, the way we pass that commitment on, in the way we train people, um, the way they they catch the, um, uh, catch the feeling, if you like, or, or catch the disease, perhaps, of... Um, continuing the profession and seeing the and, and continuing the, the world's memory uh, it, it's to me it's it's the individual in the end um, it certainly has been here and in so many other countries I've, I've observed it's come down to individuals acting as advocates speaking of getting involved and raising awareness in the opening of this episode I mentioned that on the 27th of October we have the World Day of Audiovisual Heritage coming up. Can you talk a little bit about this initiative? Yes, that, that initiative um, came from, um, uh, I think, one of the professional federations. Uh, it was put to the General Conference of UNESCO, it was adopted. On the 27th of October, uh, that date commemorates the adoption of the first UNESCO instrument uh, that relates to the preservation of film, um, recommendation for the preservation of moving images. The first time that UNESCO, um, in back in 1980, recognised that film was worth preserving. That was an important step. So it commemorates that date. Now, the, the World Day was adopted. Um, I was actually um, uh, contracted to do, to do a feasibility study at that point to test the idea and uh, how it might grow and who might support it uh, by running um, some questionnaires on uh, public questionnaires. And uh, out of that, um, a report was was um, compiled which um, suggested ways it might it might grow. And the, the day is, is effectively administered by the CCAAA, Coordinating Council of Audiovisual Archive Associations, which is where all the professional bodies come together. Um, in practice, it's often sort of taken on by a particular archive on behalf of, of the CCAAA. And um, so it has grown over the years. It, um, uh, typically, there's a website in which individual activities in various countries are registered. And the t activities can range to um, public events, screenings, lectures, other events, um, um, as a, a publicity tasks, uh, publications, the laws of a publication, um, statements that are directed at governments. It can take many forms on, on that day. Um, I guess my favourite example of it is um, comes from uh, Thailand, um, where the um, the Film Archive of Thailand, which is a remarkable showpiece of an institution that has a, an extraordinary growth story. Um, some years ago, Bangkok, uh, where it's located, suffered a huge flood and uh, the water was rising all over the place in the city and in the location of the Film Archive um, and other um, institutions, the, the water was rising around them. And so the staff of the archive <coughs> um, put sandbags around the film vault to stop the water getting into the vault. And they stayed there on vigil all night uh, until the, the water started to go down. Um, but what they did, when they were very smart, was to invite in the media, uh, inviting the television crews to see what they were doing. And they all wore T-shirts um, that advertised the World Day for Individual Heritage. So remarkable piece of publicity. Um, it was opportunistic, um, raised public awareness, advertised the day, advertised the archive, and showed how dedicated the staff were, did all those things simultaneously. Now, we don't always have floods or opportunities like that, but but um, you can create your own opportunities uh, to draw attention to your work. And publicity um, is crucial to an archive's work. It needs to be publicly visible, publicly accessible, and um, because the general public doesn't really understand what goes on inside an archive, its work needs to be explained and demonstrated, um, and people need to be linked with what is in many cases popular culture, popular heritage. So I think it's good if the average person knows that um, their favourite TV shows are actually preserved somewhere. They've got a chance of seeing them again. And uh, making that, that personal link is really important. So the day can be used um, uh, in, in publicity in that way. But of course, every day can be used to publicise the work of an archive. It's not something you just do occasionally. It should be continuous and it should be relevant and it can be done in so many ways um, through public events, through um, products, through publications, um, 
to traveling film festivals. There's, there's, um, uh, there's any number of ways in which you can do it. There are um, here in Canberra, uh, where I am, um, I happen to be also the president of the Friends of the National Film and Sound Archive. That's our, that's our current advocacy group. And uh, uh, we do advocate to the government um, to support the archive in its work. And that advocacy is needed. But we also run events which are aimed at the public. Um, and these may be um, at, at a simplest uh, film presentation, but um, can also be a lecture or something more elaborate uh, where we introduce people to aspects of the collection. And um, the archive also runs something called the Vinyl Lounge, where people are invited to come along, bring their favourite vinyl recordings, hear them played on some state-of-the-art equipment, discuss them. Um, it gets a great following. Uh, every month on a Friday night, this happens. So th there are lots of ways of reaching out to people. Yes, there are, there are conventional film screenings and, and, and um, other presentations and exhibitions, um, all of which are open to the public, all of which encourage the public to visit. Uh, and then there's the, the what's on the net. Uh, one of the um, features of the archives website uh, is uh, clips from a huge variety of Australian films that can be used for classroom um, study or for in other ways. Uh, you can go to the website, you can you can look at the History of Australian Feature Films documentary, you'll find three-minute clips from many, many of the films which you can then download and use. Or the Friends of the NFSA have another wrinkle on their website. We have what is called the Argonauts page. The Argonauts was a, a, a radio club for children run by the Australian Broadcasting Commission from the 1930s to 1970s. Um, tremendously popular, had, had a huge reach across the country, and uh, you joined up as a club. You joined up. It was the Argonauts Club, and the Argonauts were based on the um, the Greek myths about um, Jason and the Golden Fleece, and so on. Uh, it used that mythology. But you joined up. You you sent in your literary contributions um, or poems you wrote, um, uh, or other contributions that can be read out on air. And the session was on radio every day uh, for one hour, and all across Australia, um, children tuned into it. When they joined, they were given a ship name and number. Um, uh, my ship name and number was Phineas 44, uh, which, I, which I, like thousands of Argonauts, still remember because the, the club was so important to us. So on our website, the Friends website, we started an Argonauts page and we invited um, Argonauts to contribute their memories of the program because almost nothing of the program survives. It went out live, uh, no recordings were made, um, the theme song survived, but very little else. So the only way of documenting what that program was like and the effect it had was to capture people's memories. And so hundreds of Argonauts have since written in, added their memories to that page. Anyone can look it up and you can see how much the, um, the series meant to them. Now, all of these are aspects of ways in which you reach out um, to the public um, in, in ways that are specific and important to them. And uh, in doing so, they, they become part of your um, uh, part of your constituency. You know, part of part of the um, the the vast, vast range of people that will support the archive when it needs support. Have audiovisual archives, in your opinion, obtained the place they deserve in the cultural landscape? In a word, no. <laughs> uh, I think we're still seen as. Um, a bit lightweight, uh, a bit uh, more concerned with entertainment than with um, with with high culture. Um, we relate to the um, the razzle dazzle of the film industry and, and TV stars and all the rest of it. Uh, so it's that much harder, I think, uh, to gain that kind of um, high level acceptance and um, sponsor support uh, compared to. Uh, art galleries, museums, institutions, these, these are, because these are long-standing and well-accepted concepts, um, they, they, they relate uh, more readily to people who are willing to give money. I think we still have a long way to go um, to reach that point. So um, we're still, um, I think, fighting for our place in the sun, and um, maybe we'll have to do so for a long time yet. Uh, in my view, of course, um, it's, it's the... It's the audiovisual media that, that matter most today because it documents who we are, uh, it documents reality, and uh, it potentially relates to everybody very easily. But um, 
Um, what is populist isn't necessarily what uh, attracts the biggest budgets uh, or the greatest prestige. So um, uh, there it is. I think uh, we have grown out of um, the um, well, the the, the business, the show business, the business of putting on a show, the business of entertainment, and uh, um, we'll always be associated with it. Nothing wrong with that. That's that's part of what we are. Uh, but we still have to work to attain that place. And, of course, that re re applies to every aspect of what we are, including our training courses, um, our, bi our visibility through the media, uh, our um, advocacy groups, and so on. We have to explain to people what we are. And when we say, no, we're not a library, we're not an archives in the traditional sense, we're not a museum, we're an amalgam of all three, we have to explain to people what that is. Uh, they need to know. So we have to... Um, in a sense, justify ourselves for first principles. The older established concepts don't have to do that any longer. Ray, let me express once more what an honor it's been to speak to you. After so many years of not just knowing your work, but valuing it so much. Thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing your experience. And thank you for being on Technoculture. Okay, Federica, well, thank you. Thank you for listening to Technoculture. Check out more episodes at technoculture-podcast.com or visit our Facebook page at Technoculture Podcast and our Twitter account, hashtag Technoculture Podcast.